Hello, this is Ted. Can uh, well, actually, everyone's on mute right now, but um, everyone can hear me okay. All right, you should be able to see my screen now, and you should be able to hear me. I'm going to wait just a minute or two just to make sure others coming in here uh, have time to get on. So I'll start here in just a couple minutes. Okay, I'm going to get going now. Um, just hold on for one second, please. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, thank you everyone for uh, coming on the line today. <clears throat> My name is Ted Funk. I'm the Sue at uh, NWS Louisville and a team member of the, of the Tornado Warning Improvement Project team with the TWIP. Um, I'm going to be talking today roughly 45 minutes or so, and that should leave a few t uh, minutes at the end if you have questions. If you do have a question uh, in your GUI, <coughs> GUI, you can raise your hand or there is an a option to submit a question, and I will see that, at which time then I can unmute you uh, to ask a question. Hopefully we can uh, do those at the end. Otherwise, everyone's on mute. So today I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the effect of office culture, human bias, and tornado, or I'm sorry, training needs on the, on the tornado warning process in the central region. Okay, this is based on the survey we did. I mean, uh, many of you probably did the uh, tornado uh, survey that we put out. Uh, this is now a little bit over a year ago now. Um, if you did, thank you very much. It was very helpful to us as the TWIP. We're trying to figure out where we need to go, what needs to be done uh, with training uh, and development and providing a more consistent process. So this survey provided us a really good snapshot of the way or the current state of the uh, tornado warning process in the central region. Now, 326 people did respond to that. Of that, 247 were bargaining units, 79 were non-bargaining unit or management. And you can see the list of the survey sections that were in the survey. Now, what we're going to concentrate on today is the office culture, the human aspect, and the training needs. Now, that little inset picture there gives you an idea of the positions of who responds to the survey. So, by position leads had the most responses, and then you can see the others uh, from there. So, what this survey told us, basically, looking through the results, and hopefully you had a chance to already look at these. We did send these out 
in December, so it's been a few months uh, that this information has been out there. If you have had a chance, and what I'm going to do today is, is kind of maybe some things that you've already seen, but with some elaboration of some of the points to be made. If you have not had a chance to look at this, I would highly recommend that you do. Um, and not just today's presentation, but the full, uh, <clears throat> the full presentation as well, because there's a lot of other good information in there that I won't be talking about here today. Um, <clears throat> but what the survey basically told us was that we have an inconsistent warning decision process across the region. Okay. And that there's significant variation in, in, in verification across the region as well. And that's actually one of the reasons why this team was put together, because of the verification concerns. So this is what we call a bottom line issue here. Now, what contributes to this? Well, <clears throat> there's varying education, varying training and experience. That's natural. Uh, improper data set usage. Some people are maybe not using the right uh, pieces of information in the right situations or maybe they're not quite sure how to use the data sets that they have. There's philosophical differences in, in how to warn for certain types of convective modes, especially QLCSs. Um, some suggest that we should uh, maybe save the little E of zeros and ones for uh, severe with a tor possible versus tornado warnings every time. Um, <clears throat> but others suggest we should issue tornado warnings for, for everything, so that, that has caused some inconsistency. There's varying office cultures. And we see that. I'll show a little bit about that here coming up in a minute. And then finally, and maybe one of the biggest factors in all of this is the human being. You've got to have a human. Human adds great value to everything that we do, but it also creates uh, differences, uh, diversity. And that affects, uh, you know, the bottom line here, different behaviors, biases, and personal filters. And, of course, that factor then filters back into all the other ones that I have shown here. So what's our goal? Our goal is to work then on the top line. It's a basic leadership principle. You work on the top line that produces a better bottom line. So we focus on the decision warning process. And that's what we've kind of tried to be pitching here the whole time the TWIP has been in existence, to produce a consistent and a better bottom line than what we even have today. And everything I talk about today, let me put in the context, we have a lot of great meteorologists out there who put all their heart and soul into everything that they do and, and put out some really, really good warnings. But nevertheless, there's always room to look at ourselves and look at ourselves individually and as an office and to improve and to provide better service for all those that we serve. And that's what we're here to try to look at today and what we can do to try to uh, understand and maybe mitigate some of these factors. So what would contribute to a better top-line process? All right, well, first of all, is a comprehensive education program. We've all taken various uh, courses throughout our careers. The goal of the TWIP is to put out a continuing education curriculum here. We've already started to do that. We have eight uh, QLCS training modules in existence that are on the CLC. We started to work on some dual pole supercell training as well. So this is where it all starts. We're trying to basically um, raise all boats, so to speak. Some of this information that we've already put out is is review for you. Maybe some of it has some new concepts for you as well. But we're trying to provide a consistent approach here as a starting point to address the issue. Effective data usage and interrogation strategies. There's an overwhelming amount of data out there, and it's not going to get much better here. So we know we need to know how to use it right. What data to use in what situations? And the key point here is. We need strategies, and strategies to anticipate tornado genesis, not react to it. Okay, we'll, we'll elaborate that as we go along. In the office itself, in the ops area, we need uh, cohesion. We need inclusion where everyone is, uh, is, has a valuable service to provide to the team effort. And accountability uh, in behavior and actions and service provided, personal accountability. Um, <clears throat> Ultimately, we need increased consistency, increased confidence. We need to make the decisions more science-based and less human-based. Okay, and that involves more, again, self-reflection, aware of your own biases and how that affects the, everything that we do. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go. So let's start off here with office culture and see some selected results and, and what it means. And then I'll provide some recommendations that we had in our original uh, <clears throat> 
uh, file that the ones that I think I uh, really want to stress and some things that maybe you're already doing, or if not, I think that would be really good to, to look at here as we get into the new convective season just starting. Well, the first thing we ask, this isn't really office culture, it's more experience, but is how many tornado warnings have you issued in the last three years? And obviously, it's, it's something that you don't do every day. That's a good thing. We're glad we don't have to issue more than we actually issue. Um, <clears throat> some offices issue more than others, but the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, almost 60% have issued five or less in the last three years. Now, today's the start of the new Major League Baseball season. If you've only gotten five at-bats in three years, you're not doing very well. I don't think your average or your confidence is going to be running too high. All right, so that's an inherent problem in itself. All right, what about verification? Do you think about verification when you issue a tornado warning? And you can see the results are pretty across the board here. Much variation. All right, people are thinking bottom line sometimes when they're issuing these warnings, and that might have an effect on what they should be doing is more of the top line and, and the scientific process that will make that bottom line better again. This slide here is, is very telling. And it's probably one of the most uh, <laughs> important slides in terms of the, the concern of, of the state of, of where we are right now and why the efforts, I think, are needed, not just from the TWIP, but from every one of us. The question is, the tour warning decision process can vary considerably within my office. Note the results. A vast majority agree, or, or strongly agree. When I say agree, I mean agree and strongly agree with this uh, statement here. All right. Then we ask, what about the process between neighboring offices? Is that consistent? <clears throat> And the answers are more, they're skewed more to the left here because we asked the question in the opposite way. So the disagrees and the neutrals are people who say it is inconsistent between office and office, okay? So there is a concern here. It's understandable that you're not sure what the decision process is from one office to the next office. Therefore, you see the max on that right-hand graphic there is in the neutral category because they're not quite sure. But within the same office, well, first of all, the process should be similar from one office to another office. We can't have convection moving from one CWA to another CWA, and we put out different information for the same input. All right, that has to be more consistent. But within the same office, this is concerning. It's eye-opening that we see much different, uh, and people who perceive that there's a much different process going on within the same office. And obviously, that can lead to uh, inconsistency uh, in the service, we provide the warnings that we issue. As part of that, um, as part of the survey that we put out, there was an option to provide comments, and we got a lot of comments. We got a lot of comments on all kinds of subjects. So what I've done here, what we did was to take all those comments, some were quite wordy, which was fine, and hone it down to more manageable uh, uh, statements without losing the meaning of what the comment was about. So you'll see intermixed here in this presentation several comments on, on the different subjects at hand. So these were a couple of representative comments on uh, the, the idea of different processes in, in, in and across offices. So the one on the left there says, the warning process varies considerably between forecasters and offices. All right, and it's based on comfort and a personality of someone who's a more of a perfectionist versus somebody who's laid back, all right? The one on the right talks about some people have lower thresholds to issue, some are more conservative. Well, that gets down to this last bullet here, which sums all this up, that the same input going in to different people results in different output. It's human nature. It's going through our biases. It's going through our personal filters. It's going through our experiences, our fears, and everything else, and it comes out differently. All right, that leads to differences in the service that is provided. Now, it's human beings doing this. You're not going to get rid of that, all right, and you don't want to get rid of it. Diversity is a good thing, but we want to recognize, understand it, and harness it so that we can try to provide a more consistent approach or process to get to a bottom line where we take advantage of the human, but we don't let those traits and those biases dictate what ends up happening. 
All right, the next slide here is office uh, communications. There's very good communications in my office during severe weather events. And it's good to see here that most people definitely agree with that, although far more agree than strongly agree. What about between offices? Are, is there good communications as severe storms cross CWAs? And general, generally there's agreement there, but we do certainly see that results are skewed a little bit more to the left on, on the slide versus the, you know, the graphic on the left side, which is more agree. The one on the right side is more neutral and, and agree. Um, and that's understandable. You would think there should be uh, a little bit, you would think there's better communication within one office than there would be from office to office. But again, you don't want surface to suffer or change as storms just move geographically across the region. So that's why, I mean, the TWIP has put out, uh, put out a memo, I don't know, a few months back about, you know, making phone calls or chatting as severe storms cross lines, just so that there's a better awareness of, uh, <clears throat> of the storm, of reports and whatnot as, as storms cross into another person's area of responsibility. Again, we want consistent services, not just within an office, but across the NWS. Here's a couple of statements, again, that we received along this subject. It's kind of two sides of a coin here, the one on the left. Communications are a huge problem. They're dependent on the personalities of those working in the office and inner office communications between one office and another depends on office culture. That's painting a bad picture. However, the one on the right, which we hope is more representative and we think is more representative of offices in the central region, uh, probably more common, is that communications are very good in my office. And we receive timely info from other offices via phone or chat. So that, you know, that's a good thing and that's, that's the best practice we want to see for every office. And it's probably, again, the rule, not the exception, obviously. All right, now we talk about uh, how management affects things. Now you see the colors have changed on the histograms to a blue, and that's because these are bargaining unit answers only. Not all the other answers you saw red are everybody's answers put into one. So this question asks, does, manage, does management foster a positive work environment and participate in severe weather ops? Now, if we had to do this again, we probably would split up that question because there's really two questions in one there. Management can foster a positive work environment without necessarily participating in severe weather ops. But you would hope that if you're creating this positive environment that you're also participating as well and being one of the team members, one of the valued team members providing the total team service, okay? So it's okay to have them together, but I can see we got a couple comments. Well, you should have split that up and I understand that comment. Now the tendency here is uh, it's almost like a perfect stair step from right from left to right, um, <clears throat> with the majority of folks uh, agreeing. Six two thirds of the people agree, which is levels four and five agree and disagree. Or I'm sorry, agree and strongly agree, while one third are either neutral or disagree with that statement. But we are concerned about the ones here on the left side of the histogram. All right. This question was: Does management understand you if you miss? a week or short-lived tornado if you can justify your decision. Now this thing is pretty good result. The vast majority of folks agree with that statement. Um, so that's very good. That, that, you know, it's, it's understanding the nuances of what happens and you know, being able to scientifically justify what's happening, that's, that's what we are asked to do and that's what we do do. Um, but operations in general, because this is not across the board, I'll show you a couple uh, statements that have come in on, on this issue. The operations obviously must be a positive and open work environment. Where everyone works well together. Again, it's not one person's responsibility to issue a tornado warning, it's the office's decision to issue a tornado warning and the ramifications from that. Okay, we'll get to those comments after I show, show this slide. Now this one is again asking the forecasters, do you worry about manager repercussions you have an issue at warning, but no warning, I'm sorry, no tornado occurs. So that's a false alarm. Um, large majority of folks disagree with that statement. They don't worry about a false alarm that much. All right, well, what about if you don't issue a tornado warning and a tornado occurs? That's a missed event. A much different picture is painted here. We see across the board answers. Some people 
are not worried. Some people are worried a lot. There's differences right then and there, okay, about the worry. The worrying about, uh, you know, their actions, maybe the verifications, but there is, uh, there's an input here that creates different output, all right, based on the filters it goes through with the individual. Many more worry about repercussions for a missed tornado than for a false alarm. Uh, and these results, the second bullet resu results suggest that avoiding a missed event is a stronger factor in issuing a warning compared to overwarning. Now, we've got quite a range of comments on this subject, so I'll show you three, which represents almost three camps of thinking. And this is the first one. Now, this is an all one person's comment. These were like two or three put together here, but it kind of sums up one set of comments. Now, how common were these comments? Well, sometimes people like to say stuff when they're bothered by something, where by somebody else that everything is good, they may not say anything. So we're not saying that this is a predominant type of perception or opinion out there, but there, it is out there. So we want to acknowledge it. Management's paying less, less and less attention to severe weather operations versus, their, versus IDSS, or as one person put it, their IDSS agenda. Another person, management team is too involved. Being too involved is detrimental. Basically, I don't want them out there. Uh, that we can do the jobs ourselves. That's, that was the context of the, of the comment. And then other, a couple other comments were about Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking and their perception that they're being uh, second-guessed about what they're doing. When it's maybe just somebody just asking and wanting to understand what happened and, and what, you know, and trying to get input. So it may be a miscommunication, a misperception. But again, that's the one camp. The second camp, which I don't think is very common, but we saw a couple of these, is that I'm not worried about repercussions from management, but I am worried about uh, my fellow forecasters. A couple of interns uh, wrote that they were kind of their opinion didn't matter and wasn't respected because they didn't have the experience. You know, that's, that's not a good thing. That is not a cohesive, inclusive team environment. And then the last one, which we think is likely, obviously, the more common one and the one where we need to be, is that they're very pleased with the warning environment in the office and that management fully supports them, uh, regardless of false alarms and missed events. Again, if you can justify what's happening here and why those decisions were made. So across the board, much, a lot of differences across the region in terms of perceptions of what people think. So let's look at some office culture recommendations. Okay, look at some recommendations here. Principal leadership is crucial to success. It's crucial to everything we do in life, not just on the severe weather operations floor. Uh, floor. So I kind, of, I kind of already mentioned this, provide a cohesive, inclusive, and, and consistent process. You know, everyone's valuable. Everyone should be heard, and everyone should be accountable. All right, accountable for their actions. A novice concept there. A novel concept, sorry about that. All right, next one is team success cannot depend on the people who are present or their personalities or their titles, okay? All meteorologists should be able to perform duties and help out. Welcome and learn from constructive and candid input. It's human nature to get defensive when you are challenged by an action that you took. In, instead of, it takes maturity to look at your action and look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, maybe I didn't do so well, and to have somebody uh, point those things out to you. Now, the input has to be given in the right manner, but the input is given out of caring, okay, because they care about you, they care about the office, they care about the service to the community. So, learning and, and receiving well and learning from and taking actions on constructive and candid input is a good thing and something that everyone should be doing. This is something that each office could be doing or should be doing or maybe already has done. We kind of looked at some of this here at Louisville and it was eye-opening and it was, it, was, it was good to know. Determine the range of data, knowledge, biases and, and personal risk tolerances that each person has in the office and how that affects your own uh, warning services. Summarize res results, you know, find commonalities and discords and how you can strive for a more consistent approach. All right, let's go to human factors next. Some of these we've kind of already alluded to. 
Uh, this one is, I shy away from tornado warnings and rather staff another position. Most people disagree with that. Matter of fact, almost, two, or almost three quarters don't shy away, meaning they disagree or strongly disagree with that statement. 39 actually do agree, so they apparently do shy away here and agree and strongly agree. So what we did here is we broke that down by position and the percentage of the respondents who hold these positions, how many shy away? So when you do that, 26% or about one in four, which is the highest percentage of every position of MICs tend to shy away from issuing tornado warnings. Now, you know, that's not a passing on a, a judgment. That's just, you know, a statement of, of what it is. And there's obviously reasons for that. Um, interns were next with 21% or one in five who apparently, you know, would rather not issue tornado warnings. And that could be lack of experience and confidence there. And then it goes down the list here, and the ones who are least likely to shy away are uh, leads and sues, and 3% of the respondents uh, are represented there with the three leads and the one sue. And here was a comment received is no doubt some folks tend to shy away from working radar. Next question was, I have, more, I have a more difficult time making a tornado warning decision than a severe thunderstorm warning decision. Here's an interesting one. Here you go, across the board. Not much agreement here. Uh, some folks have a tough time. Some folks don't mind it at all, but again, inherent differences. Here's a comment. Give me a tornado, give me a supercell tornado any day. These weak, barely there, barely visible land spouts, that's what really makes the day tough. All right. I am, next set, these go together. I'm quite confident we asked. Are you, are you, the question was, are you confident issuing a tornado warning for a supercell versus a QLCS? Notice quite a difference. In the supercell realm, most folks agree that they're pretty confident in doing that, where the confidence is not there for the QLCS. At least the, the results are definitely skewed to the left, right, toward the neutrals and the disagrees. That in itself tells, told the TWIP team of where we need to con concentrate some initial efforts and to develop the QLCS train, and that's indeed what we have done. And again, we put out uh, uh, eight modules on the uh, CLC with QLCS training. That's required training for this convective season. Then the plan is ultimately to have 10 more. And then there's the radar features catalog, which provides a lot of follow-up examples of some things that, that come across in these videos. All right, the second bullet is important, though, that higher confidence doesn't necessarily mean much better performance. Overconfidence, sometimes, if you're overconfident with something, that can cause a failure to incorporate maybe the correct conceptual models, the right data sets for the situation, or somebody else's input. Whereby, if you have lower confidence in something, you're more likely to seek out somebody else's opinion or somebody who has more experience uh, doing this. And that's actually a good thing. So a good result can result in something not quite as good, whereby a bad result can re result in a good thing happening. All right, we asked about reports. How do the reports affect you? Um, there's not a lot of spread in the, in the different ones here, whereby the EM reports over here in the, in the top right are basically have the most influence in the tornado warning decision, or basically, therefore, probably the most trusted with spotter reports not too far behind, where social media reports are the least trusted or have the least influence. Now, one word of caution here is that you get a report that says, hey, I got a funnel cloud, I got a tornado, and you look at the radar and it doesn't show anything, you got to be careful there. It could be a false report, or it could be the fact that the radar does not resolve tornadic scale rotation, and something could be there that's just not being resolved. Here's a couple uh, comments that we got along these lines. Uh, the influence of the report depends on source reliability, you know, how credible is the report where obviously the, the social media ones seem to be questioned the most, but they become more trusted if either a picture or a video are provided and or if they're from a frequent or a known uh, provider or poster. And then a comment on the right, uh, again, fake news, fake pictures, a lot of bad reports out there we're getting from the public, even the media, even law enforcement. So. Well, that's something that we, we all have to deal with at one time or another, usually. What about the lack of reports? What if you don't get any reports? What are you going to do? All right. Is that going to keep you from taking an action you might otherwise take? Well, if you look at the two out of three rule, if you have 
uh, strong radar trends and strong NSE data supporting the warning, then that rule is satisfied. But you can see it has mixed results. It almost has like a perfect bell-shaped curve here of influence of not having to report. And therefore, you know, somebody on radar one day issuing tornado warnings, that has a big influence. And maybe they don't issue. Okay, the next person is on the radar, and that has a very low influence from them, and they do issue. Two different results, same influence. All right, personal intuition and experience. How does that factor in? What influences does that have on your tornado warning process? Well, at first glance, say, oh, this is pretty good. A lot of people say it has high influence. That's a good thing, experience, intuition. All right, well, let's think about that. Everyone's different. Everyone has different intuitions. Everyone has different experience levels, different you know, training and, and backgrounds and, and whatnot. So everybody's different. So everybody's personal intuition and experience are different as well. So if everyone's depending on these things, that inherently produces in, or, or the potential, at least, for inconsistency in service. If it's personal intuition, if it's a gut feeling, that's not quite borne out in science-based uh, reasoning as much as it is in kind of your gut and what experience has told you to do based on your past experience. So that can actually be a concern if it does have high influence, which is what's shown out here. What about fear? Well, fear is a powerful emotion. It inhibits, it prevents, it stops. It stops you from taking an action because you're concerned, you're fearful, you're afraid, okay? Are people fearful of missing a tornado? The, the graph on the left, yes, they are. Look at the range. Some are, some aren't, okay? Actually, more aren't than are, but there's definitely a, a range of response. And how, what about the one on the right? Fear of overwarning a tornado. You see, again, a range of response where they're centered into the low to moderate influence there. Um, so what this tells us is that the fear of missing actually has a slightly stronger effect on a decision than the fear of overwarning. While the fear of missing, that does facilitate a higher FAR, because you're, if you're on the fence, and you fear missing a tornado, okay, because I don't know, maybe you're worried about repercussions or service to the community or, you know, our, our, our mission, protecting life and property. And you tend to issue if you fear missing if you're on the fence. Well, that could increase your FAR because it doesn't happen. Or if you're more conservative and you fear over warning and you don't warn for the same input, that could create a lower pod potentially because maybe some of these are actually producing variability. All right, we broke it down here. A lot of questions we broke down into individual position. And the question here is, fear, do you fear of miss, missing a tornado and would, you'd rather be safe than sorry and therefore go ahead and issue it? And it's subtle, but you can definitely see a trend here from interns in blue to leads in yellow. It, the, 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 Response with the highest number, or, or the category with the highest number of responses starts out with agree with interns, and it slowly shifts to the left until it gets down to disagree and neutral with the leads. So there's a little bit less fear, apparently, uh, in general, not, you know, you can't say specific for every person, but that in general as a group, there's a little less fear with leads than interns, which is understandable, and you think, again, there, the experience part of it or having seen things in the past, it's coming into play where there's perception that uh, you know, you're not fearful and you can go ahead and, and take care of, of what you need to do based on the input that you have. A couple comments from folks. The fear of overwarning exceeds my fear of missing a tornado, but it's always in the back of my mind. A big human factor, again, fear is powerful. If it's always in the back of your mind, it's definitely affecting the warning process, whether you think so or not, okay? The one on the right says, I fear, I fear missing a significant tornado greatly, but I don't worry about the little ones so much because, you know, it's complex and it's okay maybe to miss a weak one. If you heard last week's TWIP webinar by Fred Glass and Ron Donovan, they talked about the uh, miss of tornadoes in, from 2014 and 15. And of course, as you might expect, the vast majority of those, or at least the majority of those, were the little ones, the shorter ones, the, the, the zeros and the ones. And so we get those more often. Those are the ones that cause damage. Those are the ones that cause injury. And BF1s kill people. Um, 
So if you're not worried about it, I mean, you don't want fear to be an issue, but we need to be concerned about all these tornadoes and the science-based approach of how to objectively try to warn or not warn for them, not something that's, that has its roots in fear. All right, this is interesting. This isn't really a, a human factor per se, but it goes through our personal filters. The location of the impact or the time of the day or night, how does that affect you in terms of what you do? And again, we see answers across the board here, all right? Anywhere from low to moderate high influence on these things. So again, it's the same thing coming in, but how's it, you know, these different factors are, are causing maybe a, a different response and it does affect warning consistency. This is a, uh, a comment, and this is actually a good comment. The proximity of potentially tornadic storm or population center reduces my reluctance to issue a warning because the risk is too great to life. And that's, you know, that's really true. I mean, it's all about impact, and if you have something that's bearing down on a population area, you're really nervous about that and, and what you want to do, and you may lean toward a higher-end product than you would somewhere else. But again, that is impact, but again, that's that's taking a valid factor and making a decision from it, but, you know, going back to the top line, that's not, you know, it's a bearing uh, decision based on the same set of information. Uh, in this case, likely is, is valid or does obviously has merit when it's going toward a big population center, but if you're not going to do it when it's in, you know, in a rural area, there could be people there that are just as affected as in the large area as well. All right, confirm, if you had a confirmed supercell tornado, are you more likely to issue a tornado warning for other storms? A lot of people agree to that, okay? Oops, my bad. And the one on the right, if you have a missed tornado that's confirmed, it's, it's occurred, but there was no warning, does that make you more likely to issue tor tornado warnings for other storms? And this is all in the same event. And there's general agreement with that. Now, the effect of the confirmed tornado, like there's a confirmed tornado, you know there's a confirmed tornado, and now you're responsible for issuing warnings for other supercells in that same event. Are you more likely to issue tornado warnings because of that? Again, people tend to agree with that. And the effect of a confirmed tornado is greater, you know, this graph on the left, is greater than having a missed tornado, and I'm going to issue more tornado warnings because I missed one, uh, which is the graphic on the right but they both affect verification. So the idea here is evaluate each storm on its own. And that, you know, if one produces a tornado, that maybe the NSC is, NSC is conducive, but past events cannot dictate future actions and decisions, okay? The near storm environment is not the same across the CWA, it can vary greatly. Or maybe the storm that produced a tornado is moving along a subtle boundary that you may or may not have detected or intricate uh, storm scale processes with the RFE front flank front downdraft and dynamic low aloft that create a tornado in that storm versus in another storm. Uh, so there's differences. And a great case in point is one that we had on March 2nd, 2012, where in southern Indiana we had a 49 mile path tornado that peaked at EF4 and killed a few people, unfortunately. Um, and we were preconditioned by that storm because we had a lot of other supercells that developed in central Kentucky a little bit later in the day, and they were awesome looking storms with great uh, mesocyclones aloft, produced large hail, and a couple few did produce some weaker tornadoes, but a lot of them didn't. They were just outflow dominant, um, producing wind and hail, and we way overwarned for tornado warnings. Again, we were preconditioned because of what had happened just an hour or two earlier. Couple comments. Confirmed tornado does lead me toward tornado warnings for other cells. Um, whereby uh, this comment on the right uh, tries not to let that be an influence. So you know, some it, again it does influence others. It does not quite influence. We look more at the processes of what's actually happening and how that affects tornado genesis. All right, excessive noise. And this is in operations. Excessive noise in operations degrades my thought process and the ability to issue timely tornado warnings. Um, again. Lots of variability here across the board. People tend to disagree with that, but obviously it does affect the number of people. What about fatigue, whether it's mental fatigue or physical fatigue? Does that degrade your thought process? And you see a much different result here. Matter of fact, these two uh, graphics have different slopes to them. And <clears throat> the negative effect of fatigue is much more actually, or certainly more than excessive noise in operations. Um, but clearly, both of them, affect the tornado warning process. 
And for forecaster A, it may not be an issue. For forecaster B, it may be a huge issue. And they're both responsible for looking at the same data and doing the same, uh, you know, same responsibility, same service. And all this input is, is creating a different, uh, potentially a different result. All right, a couple comments here. Excessive noise. Actually, these two comments are completely different, but they're both with noise and operations. Excessive noise negatively affects my ability to issue timely warnings. Person B, I prefer noise and operations. It keeps me focused. That's great. But person A doesn't see it that way. But fatigue seems to be a little bit more universal uh, approach, at least it should be, that it is an issue, especially if there's low staffing. Now, you know, continuity on the, on the, on the warning floor and, and the, the warning desk there is, is good. You know, it provides continuity, but if you're doing it for too much, then you got to switch out. Very interesting here. We, uh, we broke it down by forecasters and leads after a long time with the radar. Are you willing to let someone else issue warnings? Now, again, it's subtle, and I'm not speaking, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make a big event here, but it is kind of interesting that the leads as a group, at least in purely from the responses we got, not trying to make a statement here or anything, but the leads overall seem to be a little bit less agreeable to switch than the forecasters because the forecaster responses peak in the agree and strongly agree, the leads clearly peak in the agree with more responses in the neutral and disagree section. So one of the comments that we actually got here I don't know who it was from, what position, um, but it's pretty, uh, it's, it's not good. It's like I struggle relinquishing the warning position because I enjoy it and I'm confident in my abilities and I struggle to trust others. And we'll leave it at that. All right, so human factor recommendations here. All right, we've seen this. Individual reaction to stimuli, different stimuli, people react differently, contributes to service irregularities. Okay, so again, be introspective. You know, understand your own biases. You know, we tend not to maybe do that. Somebody else sees us better than we see ourselves sometimes. But understand those, reduce them. You know, take a really coherent look at yourselves uh, and understand the tendencies of others too. This is one that wasn't in the original uh, recommendation list, but I added this one late because I really think that it kind of it hits home. And it's, it's easy to understand. I'll read it and then I'll explain it. Competence produces confidence. Confidence produces courage. And courage overcomes fear. Okay, so competence. How do you be competent in something? It's through training through repetitive training, through understanding what's happening and re-understanding and learning new things about it. Um, you know, the experience, the training, that's all part of it. That's what we're trying to do as the TWIP team, work on the competence factor by producing the training. That produces the confidence and to do something. Now, confidence produces courage. How do you have courage? It doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from confidence. Confidence is kind of a... a, a you know, a, a foundation, so to speak, to courage. You've got to have confidence that courage can be built upon. When you're confident in something, you're more likely to have courage to take an action. And that action, that courage to take that action overcomes fear. It overcomes fear of missing a tornado, overcomes fear of, of overwarning a tornado, it overcomes fear of repercussions of, of a fellow employee, fear of your own fears, it can overcome, you know? So it's great on the operations form floor, it's great in life. Competence, have competence, that's where we start. That's the top line to mitigate the fear of bottom line. A word of caution with all that said, be careful, don't be too confident. If you have really high confidence, that could mean you're not willing to learn or grow as much as maybe you still need to do. And maybe you become complacent in your actions and don't properly assess things as well as you should or look at the right data sets. And therefore, seek second opinions. Be more open-minded, receptive to different sentiments, okay? And not, not only whether to issue or not, but you know, what part of the storm actually needs to be issued for? Not the whole storm, maybe just the tornadic part of the storm. 
And then as we saw here, fatigue and, fatigue and stress really can decrease situation awareness. And you may not even be aware of it, okay? But really do change out uh, to keep the performance optimal. This is something everyone should do, be doing right now. Not just now, but it should have been doing for the longest time. We've talked about this. Perform frequent candid self-assessments of performance and personal warning decisions. Look yourself in the mirror. Recognize what you see. You know, the good things are great. The bad things you acknowledge and you work on, they're paramount to, to improvement here. We've got one comment along this line from a person in, in the survey, which is really pretty interesting. It hits right home with, with, with this recommendation here is, the comment is that I'm amazed at the number of forecasters who don't review previous events that they've worked. I see far too many forecasters throw the event over their shoulder and move on to the next event. You don't learn, you don't improve. We don't provide a better mission and service to the community by doing that. While you're doing that, integrate those personal assessments into a team assessment and do postmortems for the office centered on the science and the human factors. You know, don't do dissertations here. You're not getting a PhD. Just do short and sweet ones where you talk about the successes and failures. And I know all offices do postmortems, but maybe they should be uh, centered a little bit and incorporate a little bit more of the human factor into them. All right, our last section here, I'll go a little bit longer, but we'll wrap it up here in, in the next several minutes, is training needs. All right. Severe storm and tornado genesis conceptual models, they do have high influence here. That's shown out in the results from this question. But it's the correct conceptual models that we need to look at. You know, the valid principles. Some of these conceptual models that we learned way, maybe many years ago, have changed uh, to some degree. There's new evidence, new research out there that maybe hasn't gone through the RTO process and be reflected in our, our warnings as much as they should. But there is a lot of neat stuff out there, especially dual pole, which I'll talk about here in a second, to, again, anticipate versus to react to intricate processes. And then V sub R. How does V sub R affect you? Uh, and obviously, it affects people a lot, rotational velocity. But rotational velocity, you've got a, a word of caution. We're actually soon to come out with a, a one or two pager on some V sub R recommendations rotational velocities and what it's actually good for and how to use it and where the limitations are for it as well. The trends obviously are important. And, you know, V sub R tends to increase right before the tornado, but V sub R tends to be more of a reactive type tool versus an anticipatory tool. In other words, when you see those V sub R values increase, that might be in, in, uh, as a result of the tornado. That's why V sub R is increasing, so it's already on the ground. Or it reduces your lead time because visa bars increasing the tornado is about to occur versus there's some other tools that can anticipate better. We'll talk about those here in just a second. Uh, this one here, people, uh, the results of these show that people do want a better understanding of QLCS and supercell conceptual models on the left, and they want better visualization and strategies to interrogate the vast amount of data that we have available. Now, we haven't gotten too much of the TWIP team into the thing here on the right, uh, and we do ask if you guys are out there using some really cool uh, visualization and data assessment strategies, we'd, we'd love to hear about them. And maybe, you know, those could be incorporated into some best practices. But the idea is you got to use the right data uh, in the right situations. All right, and I think the last graphic here is I'm comfortable with new products, MRMS and dual pole. I know how to use them well for tornado potential. And there's general agreement with that, not overwhelming evidence. A couple comments with that is I feel comfortable with dual pole, but I have not found it very useful in a tornado warning decision process. This one says a dual pole can be noisy, which is true, but many only, or it may only in retrospect shed light on what happened. So it limits to how much data one can examine, which that is true. But in terms of being only good in retrospect is because you're looking at TDSs and CC data, which again, more validates a tornado existing versus predicting a tornado will soon occur. And that's where there's other data within dual pole that can help. I'll talk about that just in a second. And this person wants more training on, on dual pole and, uh, to, you know, leverage the new, tool, the new tools versus being stuck in the ways that we've always used in the past, the oldies, the goodies. That may be not as good as some of the new goodies that are now out there. 
All right, so the five-tier training strategy, speaking of training here, um, quickly, uh, we've, I think we've shown this before. The phase one is just providing the background materials, the modules and the, and the videos that we're providing, the webinars like we're doing right now. Uh, Hands-on training is the you know, local Sioux and maybe the Twipple getting in there and providing one-on-one -on -one training and then addressing individual needs. Uh, quick reference guides, we put out some of those with the, with the TWIP and again, the strategies and the procedures will be helpful there. Uh, stage, stage or phase four, you know, short and sweet concentrated simulations, some of rent reviews we've talked about, and again, the radar features catalog is a big, big deal here, and that's going to be expanded consistently here. Provide a lot of examples to back up the videos and the webinars that we're presenting. And then level five, where you now are the expert, you go out and train and help others. So uh, <clears throat> wrapping up here with training and radar recommendation, recommendations, all right, this one is basically about supercell rotation. It's just more of a reminder a little bit here because we see this happening. To understand how radar resolves rotation, I think we all know that supercell rotation that we see reflects the low or mid-level mesocyclone depending on range, not the tornado. But even a TBS, tornado vortex signature, isn't a tornado. It could be, re reflect the flow around it. Only in extremely rare cases at extremely close range with big tornadoes the intense small-scale rotation might be the actual tornado, but it will be degraded, all right? So that's where, you know, you get a report. Oh, I don't see much. Well, it's because radar is not resolving well, it very well. And that's where it gets into predicting. I know there's out, uh, imperial relationships out there, but that's where predicting EF, potential EF scale by V sub R gets down a slippery slope. And here's another uh, one that we've all been told about that in supercells, rotation builds down. Well, that's really not the case, and we'll get into that as we provide more supercell uh, training. That is this low-level streamlined vorticity that gets tilted and stretched rapidly into the updraft uh, by the dynamic law aloft, so it's not a build-down process, even though it might look like that as an illusion on radar. All right, and don't pull here. Proper training assessment is, is great. It's not just about CC data, all right? It's, uh, it can define up, updraft strength, hydrometeor character. It affects that, which then affects the RFD buoyancy and tornado genesis. Some new stuff out there is, I don't know if it's, it's pretty new, is looking at ZDR arcs and looking at the separation between the centroids of ZDR and KDP, which is a, probably a new concept for most folks. But if you understand what it is and how to use it, it can actually help anticipate tornado genesis, not react to it based on some of the tools that we currently use. Now, let me just say this, we, we're, we're, you know, the training we're doing with the TWIP on this subject, um, <clears throat> we already have a module that's done and we have a, one of our, uh, John Stopcotty, uh, uh, one of our team members, he already did a storm of the month presentation back in 2016 that talked about some of this stuff. So we're going to be putting those two out, plus this uh, one pager on V sub R uh, out within the next couple of weeks, kind of to get something out there on this. And it's really neat. It's really some cool stuff. So uh, look forward to that. And we'll continue to uh, put out more as we, as we go later in, in the uh, calendar year. Uh, and then just West scenarios, not telling anything you, you don't know, but not just the conventional ones that are, that are centered on radar trends and, and near star environment. But, you know, more effective ways to, to handle different data sets and ways to visualize data, you know, the strategies to do that. And ones to do, you know, simulate speed. How fast are you getting the warning out? And how effective is your polygon? Okay, you know, it simulates stress and time constraints. And, again, to limit aerial over warning. You don't need to put a warning out over the whole supercell because, you know, there's not going to be severe weather across the whole supercell, so that can be effective as well. And this is the last recommendation is basically just embrace, complete the training videos we put out there. A lot of it's uh, required, but even if it's recommended, we recommend that you do it. Um, and again, the Radar Features Catalog is, is a great thing here. Again, the idea is to try to make the process more science-based and to incorporate the good aspects of the human interpretation and experience without the negative parts in those filters by understanding the differences and trying to come up with a plan to try to uh, take the best but limit what inherently causes much difference. Make the process and the decision more objective and less subjective, uh, that being the goal. And we've shown this before. Uh, these are our websites on Google and VLAB. So that's it.
Uh, we still have about you know several minutes here. If you do have a question, I appreciate you listening to me the whole time. And if you have a question, I will look in here, raise your hand here in your GUI, or submit a question, and we'll I'll try to unmute you and you can ask a question. Unfortunately, I can't unmute like everyone at the same time. I'm looking at the little icon here, which talks about uh, whether you have your hands raised. And I don't see anyone right now that has their hand raised, or I don't see any questions submitted. So I'll just give it a couple extra minutes. If I don't see anything, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it. Um, but certainly feel free to uh, send the TWIP team or me an email uh, later on, and we will um, try to answer that. And if I did everything right here, this recording, this presentation should be recorded and we'll get a uh, URL out for that uh, when we can within the next couple days. All right, I'm not seeing anything, any uh, questions, so um, we'll let it go with that. Um, thank you very much for attending. I hope it uh, was good. I hope you learned, or, you know, it was a good review for you. You learned a few things. I hope there's actions, good actions, tangible actions that you can take now or already have taken. Um, and, you know, try to make this, uh, this convective weather season the best one that we've had in terms of our service to uh, our partners in our community. <clears throat> so again, uh, any questions later on, feel free to ask and uh, we'll get a URL here on, uh, on a recording. But thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <clears throat>